segments from Life in the Arts can now be viewed on demand on YouTube.com. Just go to YouTube.com, add slash longtimers, and that will take you to our YouTube channel. Welcome to another edition of Life in the Arts Classic Light, the art enrichment program featuring art lessons, virtual field trips, artists from the past, student films, and performing artists. On today's broadcast, a lesson in color with our favorite art teacher, Lori Myers. Lori will take us for a spin on the color wheel and talk about complementary colors and how they are used in art and also in advertising. Our virtual field trip segment takes us to the mall where we'll see a public demonstration of painting by lovely artist Jennifer Sullivan. The painting of Divine Feline is done to the accompaniment of Concarazon. Life in the Arts Classic Light begins meow. Hi, I'm Lori Myers and I'm going to be doing an art project with you today about color theory. Now first I'd like you to look at this color wheel. We've got three basic colors called primary colors, yellow, red, and blue, that are your basics. You've got to start with those. But with those, you can make every other color in the rainbow. Yellow and red make orange. Red and blue make purple. Blue and yellow make green, right? So this, those orange and purple and green are your secondary colors. And then the ones that you make, you know those big crayon boxes that have the 64 crayons and it says um, yellow orange and red violet and all of those? Well, those are tertiary colors, your third group, and you make those by mixing a primary and a secondary color together. So we're going to do this art project, this wonderful little floral painting today, and I want to show you something about what the color wheel can do for you not only in mixing your colors, because every box of paints makes a really almost a different color wheel. Every little bit of pigment mixed is a little different every time. So um, when we're doing this, uh, you want to make a color wheel of your own for reference. The other thing is when you look opposite the color wheel, you find something called a complementary color. A complementary color is, well, let's say Christmas colors, red and green. Easter colors, these are little tricks that I use to try to remember, purple and yellow. Okay, now the other one is blue and orange. And we don't have a holiday for that, but how many kids uh, ate Frosted Flakes this morning? Okay, Tony the Tiger's orange and the box is blue. Now advertisers didn't do this as a mistake. They decided what's going to really grab the viewer? We want these products to pop off the shelf into mom's cart so that they take them home. So they use this very often, and that's complementary color. And if you want to really bring spark to your work or pizzazz, use a complementary color. And you're going to watch it happen right on this painting today. All right? So I use watercolor paper because it works really well, but you can practice with any kind of paper. And I just want to let you know that the more you paint, the better you'll get. And some days you'll have great painting days and you'll look at your work and you'll say, I love it. Some days you'll look at it and say, oh, I don't know how to paint at all. I still do this. I've been painting a long, long time. It just happens. Okay, so I always ask you to make a blob of color. And I don't want you to go straight from your paint box to the paper. It's better to mix your paint right here on the back of the paint box then you'll know what thickness the paint is. You know, that's really the key to watercolor, is the thickness that you paint. If it's too runny, then you're not going to be happy. You're going to have these things, and they're going to be flowing all over the paper, and you're going to say, oh, I don't have control of my watercolor, or I don't like watercolor because I can't control it. If you mix the paint right here, you're going to know just what color it is. You're going to see how much is loaded on your brush and whether it's going to go on the paper right. And believe me, it takes practice, so don't worry about it. The more you do it, the better it'll get. So I, I sometimes paint the same painting over and over again until I really get that flow of the paint and, and get my composition right and see where everything goes. 
All right, so do we have a blob of red paint on the back of our palette? I think that's about right. You see how it's not too runny, but it's not so dry that the brush isn't kind of shiny. Okay, so here's my surface. Generally, a piece um, like a floral is really good done on a triangular shape. So even a flower arrangement, if you look at flower arrangements that come from florists, they're done kind of on a, on a triangle shape, and they're also done with odd numbers. So in your paintings, you're going to want to remember, odd is better. What's an odd number? You guys know? One, three, five, seven, nine. Nine is probably too many, but um, I generally go on the number five. It seems to work out well. All right, so I've got red on my brush. This is called loading your brush in watercolor. And I'm just going to look and decide where I want to go. And you follow along with me. I'd like your piece to kind of look like mine. And I've worked on the placement, so kind of look right, not dead center. We don't want to break up our paper right down the middle like this or like this, horizontally or vertically. It's better to be just a little bit off center. Makes for a more interesting composition. All right, so I'm going to make three donuts, and I'm just going to swirl them around like this. And maybe I'll add a little bit more water. My paint's not really moving. It's really sticking to this. But I'm going to keep a hole in the center of my donut, and I'm just swishing around. And maybe my last donut, I'm going to even add more water, and this is going to be a little bit smaller. Okay, so right now, does it look like a flower? No, it looks like three red donuts. Okay, so try that first. Okay, you're going to kind of see how the thickness of the paint is. And then make sure to rinse your brush. We want a nice clean brush. The one thing that you can really ruin a watercolor is if you get your colors muddy. And muddy means that you're mixing too many colors together. Really three colors are about as much as you can mix without having it turn into a muddy something. Okay, so now I'm going to take my orange, and I'm going to make my orange blob. And these paints are kind of sticky. I don't know about yours, but these have a little bit more whatever it is they put in there to make them last. So it's kind of hard to pick up. So do you notice how I'm not really jamming my brush in here? I'm using the tip to lift the color off and put it on the back of my palette. And they're kind of shiny. I just got these the other day, so they're a little new for me. And I'm telling you, every paint box is a little bit different, so don't be surprised if, you know, you do, it takes a while to get used to. Okay, now I'm going to rinse my brush out. I've got my orange blob, but I want to load my brush in a different way. I want the bottom of my brush, or this part that's down by the ferrule, to kind of be clear water. And I want the tip to have some orange in it. And I'm going to make this orange daisy, and I'm going to use just the shape of the brush. I'm testing it on a paper towel to see whether it'll work. And it does. If you feel like you've got too much water in your brush, dab it off on a paper towel. If, um, if your paint is too dry, it's going to look scratchy, add more water. That's going to take a little playing on your part to get it just right. Okay, now I'm looking at this, and I think right in here is where I want my orange daisy. So I'm going to push down and pull up. And do you see how I have a two-tone thing there? Okay, so that's lights and darks. And of course, you want some contrast in, in watercolor, in any kind of artwork. And I'm just going to push down and pull up. And I'm going to keep doing that around in a circle. I'm going to try to leave a little centerpiece that's not filled in. And if you can get to used to loading your brush this way, you can get that wonderful kind of watercolory two-tone effect where you've got kind of a dark orange and then a little bit lighter towards the center. And you know, it's going to change every time. No two paintings are exactly the same. That is the beauty of watercolor. It kind of flows and moves and you know, you're kind of at its mercy sometimes. It's sometimes going to do what it wants to do, and that's what's fun about watercolor, too. But give yourself a break. If it's not moving exactly where you want it, don't worry about it. All right, so those are just kind of a swishy brush stroke for the donut. Push down, pull up for the daisy. And now I'm going to show you a different one. Okay, I'm going to load this blue on here. 
And this is like scion blue. This is a blue that they use for printing. For me, it's a little bit too turquoisey. And so watch what happens to this blue. We can turn it in kind of into an indigo by adding purple. Okay, and look at that yummy blue you can get. Okay, so don't be afraid when, when you're playing with your watercolors to mix colors, because to me that's a better looking color. Okay, now I've loaded my brush kind of the same way, and the tip is blue, and the body of the brush is a little bit uh, watery. But this time I want you to hold your brush differently. You know how you'd pick up a lunch sack or, or your lunch pail? You'll have your hand over the top of it. I don't know whether you could tell, but take your hand, put it over the top, and see whether you can roll the brush in your hand. This is going to give you a really cool brush stroke. It's going to make this blue flower, so you want to roll the brush in your hand. So right here, I'm going to go roll. I need a little bit more color on the tip. Roll. Overlap a little bit. Roll. It's kind of funny to hold the brush upside down and roll it but it gives the, the best texture of light and dark. Okay, I'm going to have to kind of go backwards here and just kind of roll it on, let that kind of move around. But this time you're going to use what is called a dry brush. Dry brush is where you don't have lots of water on your brush. You have lots of paint. Now this purple doesn't pick up real well, but we're going to try it. We might have to do it several times. Okay, and so now I've got this on the tip. You want your flowers to kind of come up and be moving, not just a static triangular arrangement. You want to move the viewer around. You want their eyes to, to be focused in on your painting, not drifting off looking around at something else. And so we move the viewer by how we move the lines in our painting. Okay, so Right here, I'm going to go dot, 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 and these are like little triangles that get narrow towards the top. Okay, and you see I'm just almost not pushing my brush down at all. Okay, so there's one little flower. See, it's broader at the base, and it comes up narrow almost to just one little dot at the top. And I'm going to make three flowers in that way, just picking up the purple on the tip of my brush, my brush is almost too wet, so I'm going to dab it off on the paper towel, take some of the water out of it. Now when I use watercolors at home, I use watercolors in tubes, and they're professional grade watercolors. And you can even buy watercolor in tube that, that isn't very expensive. They have wonderful sets at art stores. And I'm telling you, the difference between a little paint box like this um, and a watercolor in a tube, even if it's a student grade, is remarkable. You're going to love what happens because you can put it on thick and thin and, and the color is much, much more vibrant. Now, I like you to paint with your whole arm. I don't want you to just paint tight with your little wrist. It won't work. I like big, loose stroke. So out of the top or out of the center of this daisy, I'm going to make a big, loose stroke of green. Is it coming to life? Looks better already to me. Okay, now they're not going to all be the same size big loose off of the tip of your brush. You want to vary the size and vary the direction. They're not little straight lines that are just coming up out of the top. Okay, you want to curve those lines. Draw the viewer around. Okay, are red and green complementaries? Yeah, they are. So already, this plain little picture is coming to life because of complementary color. Now, if you look on the color wheel, let's take a look at this right now. If you look on the color wheel, if I have orange, what is the center of my daisy going to be? Do you guys know? Okay, well, it's going to be the opposite, which is blue. So, with a dry brush, I'm just going to pick up a dot of blue on my brush and I'm going to go dot, 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 like I did my little purple lavender flowers, and make it look like the center of a daisy. Looking better? It's coming to life. Mm -hmm. All right, rinse your brush real well. Okay, so the opposite thing, if I have a blue flower, 
What's going to bring that to life? Do you guys have it? I think it's an orange dot, right? Okay, so again, I've rinsed my brush. I don't have a bunch of water on here. This is pretty much a dry brush technique. And I'm going to dot in a few little orange dots. Is it looking better? How, how are yours looking? Good? Don't worry, if they're not exactly like mine, I've painted this painting many, many times. Okay, tried a lot of different times. Now, I've got these interesting little um, lavenders. Okay, so what's going to bring them to life? Want to look at my color wheel again. Opposites, I use Easter color, yellow, and purple. So we've got our purple flowers right there. What am I going to do? You want your brush to be really, really clean this time, totally clear, and you're going to pick up a little yellow paint and dot, dot, dot. Not too much because you don't want to make brown. If you mix complementary colors together, you get browns or neutrals. If you, look, you, if you put them next to each other, you create vibrant paintings. So if you're painting something neutral like the desert, you might want to use those complementary colors mixed. But we want this to be bursting with life. So I'm trying not to get too close. It's still a little wet. You might want to wait in between a little, let it dry. Very often when I'm doing a big watercolor piece, I have to let almost the whole thing dry before I can continue. Okay, so this one I mixed just the green. Then I cleaned my brush real well because we don't want to wreck our yellow. And I made kind of a nice lime green out of here. Flowers have bases that are kind of like triangles. So right now I'm going to put little V's or little triangles underneath my flowers so they have something to hang on to. Okay, and they don't have to be perfect little V's, but a little thing like that, maybe a little darker dab of green in there. You don't want them all exactly the same color. All right, so that's something that'll hold the flower head up. Okay, we're not going for total realism. This is kind of an impressionistic picture, but you also want the viewer to think that these are flowers and not just dots and dabs of color. So the V underneath kind of gives it that more realistic quality. All right, now I have my green here, and I told you you could mix this with any color. See the orange right next to it? Mush, mush, mush. Ooh, that makes a yummy green. Better leaf green, maybe. Okay, now, when we look out in a garden, we don't see every single stem. And in your paintings, I don't want to see every single stem. I don't want every stem coming down to the bottom, out of the bottom of your page. I think you guys are beyond that, okay? And so, let's just take, with the tip of our brush, and give the impression of a stem. If this is impressionistic work, the impressionists were busy trying to capture light and taking everyday subjects and showing them. Okay, so all of those have stems in some way, but it's not a thousand stems coming to the bottom of the paper. Right? Now, with this, I'm going to use my rolling brush technique. I've got that yummy green on that I made with the orange and the, and the green, and now I'm going to just roll in some leaves. Okay, just dots and dabs of color. Not a lot. You don't want to overdo it. And these brushes are wonderful because they have a wonderful tip on them. And sometimes I'll come back in with a little darker green, make a little shadow on the side of the stem. But I still, I want this to be fresh. I don't want to overdo it. I can take this right now and make a few little veins on the leaf, but I really, I don't want to overpaint. Okay, that looks good to me right there. All right, I'm going to rinse my brush. Now, this would be just fine as a painting, but to me, it doesn't have quite the pizzazz that I wanted. So, if you don't have this, which you probably don't, this is what tube watercolor looks like, um, you can take and I'm going to use a toothbrush this time. Pretty yucky, huh? Don't brush your teeth with this. Ask your mom if you can take a toothbrush at home that's old to use it for this. And I'm going to take this yellow paint and put it right on the back of my paint box. And you see how thick this is? That's the beauty of tube watercolor. 
Okay, and I'm going to get it on my toothbrush here. Now this is too wet. If I try to spray my painting, which I'm going to show you about spattering, I will end up with drips right now. So I got to kind of work it on the paper towel, make sure that it's not too wet. I'm going to take my finger and I'm going to start to spray. And I'm just going to bring this to life like the pollen, like it's springtime and the pollen is just popping out of the flowers. Okay, this project is pretty simple and you probably all did a really good job on it. I'm sure you did. Um, and uh, I hope you remember some of the techniques we learned. But this painting right here is done in the exact same way, although I used this little sponge for the lavender. I just dabbed it and sponged the lavender on. And then when it was dry, I went over the top of it. But this is layered. This is not so layered. This is just a quick little painting. If you were to let this dry and you wanted to make it even stronger, maybe more realistic, you can do something called glazing where you take the paint and you just paint over the top of where you've already gone. But you want to wait till it dries, otherwise you get a big blobby mess and that's when kids go, oh man, it's all moving around, I don't like it. So that's when you have to be patient and let it dry. Also, if you want to do something realistic, something more like this, done exactly in the same way, except I drew these flowers first. But my brush technique was basically the same. When I wanted to do the little stems, I had to do a dry brush. When I did the little dots, I used a dry brush making the little dots. But the color, the way it was applied, in these poppies right here was basically just rolled on and while it was wet I tipped in a little bit. When it was completely dry I put the lines in to make it a bit more realistic. But the greens I made the same way I made the greens in here and the colors exactly the same. So you can get really pretty detailed and very realistic in this. Okay so our basic color theory is complementary colors attract and they make your painting really vibrant. Okay, so red and green, one combination. I just used Christmas because can you picture Santa Claus standing in front of a big Christmas tree? Red and green, there's some reason they did it because he stood out. Uh, purple and violet, can you imagine a big purple egg with a yellow chick in front of it? All right, Easter colors. Uh, we've all seen those color combinations and in nature you're going to see the color combinations just like that as well and blue and orange okay blue and orange the best thing for you guys to probably remember is the kicks box or the frosted flakes box um, of course I do a lot of laundry because I'm a mom so I remember the tide box because it's orange and has big blue writing on it okay so that is our basic color theory and color wheel and I hope you had fun with me today thank you
next time on Life in the Arts. Artist Laurent Davison shares his knowledge of the art of mobile making. It was in the studio of world-renowned artist Alexander Calder that Laurent learned the art of mobile making. So get out some light cardboard, and some scissors or X-Acto knives, pencils, scotch tape, some string, paper clips, and thumbtacks, and you'll be ready to learn how to make mobiles. We'll help celebrate Asilomar State Park and Conference Center's 50th anniversary with an Artist from the Past segment. Life in the Arts proudly presents Jill Jackson as Julia Morgan, architect of Asilomar. Julia Morgan was one of the first women to graduate from the University of California at Berkeley with a degree in civil engineering. She is also the architect of Hearst Castle. Coming up next on Life in the Arts. Be sure not to miss it.